This video is a compendium of ancient culture. It's a celebration of lost civilizations. It's an assembly of ancient artifacts. Put less poetically, it's a collection of fantastic archaeological discoveries. We're going to take you on a visual tour of places and objects from long ago and far away, rediscovered by the archaeologists of the modern era. And it starts now. The world's oldest portrait of a living human being is smaller than a human thumb, and comes from Dolni Vestonice in Moravia, Czechia. Whoever sculpted this tiny portrait from mammoth ivory did so 26,000 years ago during the last ice age. Most historians agree that the tiny sculpture is a representation of an adult female, with her hair tied up at the top of her head, but a fringe reaching her brow. Another less popular interpretation is that she's wearing a fur hat. There are depictions of humans that are far older than this, but experts say that this piece is different because the face has distinctive features, making it more likely to be a portrait of somebody the artist knew, or perhaps the artist herself, rather than a generalized depiction of the human form. Some historians have speculated that the artist may have found the subject interesting because her face was unusual. One of her eyes is wide open, but the other is closed and represented by a slit. It's possible that she may have had a stroke or another medical issue, but obviously we'll never know for sure. In December 2022, the world's oldest surviving pair of jeans was sold at an auction for $114,000. The jeans are a little water damaged, but that's hardly surprising given how and where they were found. They were discovered in a trunk inside a shipwreck off the coast of North Carolina, USA in 1857. It's likely that they belonged to a miner who was in North Carolina because of the region's gold rush. What makes historians inclined to describe these pants as jeans rather than any other type of trouser is the presence of a five-buttoned fly. The ship they were found on is the SS Central America, known to archaeologists and historians as the Ship of Gold because of the vast quantity of valuable artifacts found within its wreck. After being discovered in 1988, the wreck has thus far yielded over 21 tons of artifacts, including several tons of gold coins. The trunk containing the jeans belonged to a man named John Dement, who lived in Oregon. It's been speculated that they might even be an early Levi Strauss product, but that hasn't been verified. The Book of Kells has been described by some historians as medieval Europe's greatest treasure. It's also known as the Book of Columba and is an illustrated manuscript of the Gospels, written in Latin and dating to the 9th century. Experts aren't entirely sure which country the book was written in, but they're confident it was a Columban monastery in either England, Scotland, or Ireland. The Gospels, as they appear in the Book of Kells, are drawn from the Vulgate, but also include passages from older versions of the Bible. Aside from the medieval Europe's greatest treasure moniker, the Book of Kells has also been called the ultimate masterwork of Western calligraphy, and the finest achievement of insular illumination. Analysis of the script suggests that the manuscripts are the work of at least three different scribes, and possibly more. Scholars believe that it has a sacramental purpose rather than an educational one. It would have stayed on the high altar of a church and would likely only have been used for reading the gospel during mass. Even if you're not religious, you can appreciate the beauty of the artifact. It's often said that to understand a person, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. So how much can we really tell about a person from their shoes? Well, that depends on the shoe and where it was found. In this case, it's a 5,500-year-old shoe from Armenia, discovered inside a cave in June 2010 and thought to be the oldest leather shoe in the world. This humble piece of footwear was made from a single piece of cowhide and molded to perfectly fit its owner's foot roughly 1,000 years before the pyramids of Giza were built. Oddly, the shoe was stuffed full of grass when it was discovered. Archaeologists are divided on whether the grass kept the shoe warm when it was being worn or helped to keep its shape after being taken off. They also don't know whether it was worn by a man or a woman. It's a seven in American women's sizes, but as the men of the time were much smaller than they are today, that doesn't necessarily confirm anything. 
To answer our original question, we suppose you can't really find much out about a person from their shoes at all, other than the fact that leather shoes have apparently remained in fashion for several millennia. Back in the 1970s, an antique dealer based in Amsterdam bought a pack of playing cards for $2,800 based on the assessment that they came from the 16th century. The dealer was shrewd and thought that the 52 South Netherlandish cards might be older than that. He was right. It took him five years and plenty of research to prove his case, but he was eventually able to demonstrate that the cards were made somewhere between 1465 and 1480, based on the style and contents of the images on the cards, watermarks, and even the hairstyles of the Burgundian court figures that the cards depict. The watermarks are particularly important, as they are of a kind that was common in the Netherlands during those years. With its revised age, this is now the oldest set of playing cards in the world. Instead of the diamonds, hearts, clubs, and spades we know today, they feature horns, game nooses, tethers, and dog collars. The antiques dealer was able to sell the pack on to the Met Museum in New York, USA for $143,000, a huge return on his initial investment. The wine cup of Shah Jahan is exactly what it sounds like. It's a wine cup, and it belonged to Shah Jahan, the Mughal emperor of the 17th century. That basic description doesn't do justice to the artifact, though. The emperor's cup is made of white nephrite jade and features a paisley design, complete with a handle made in the shape of a ram. Its pedestal is shaped like a lotus flower and asanthus leaves, and an inscription that runs around the base reads, Second Lord of the Conjunction, identifying Shah Jahan as second only to Timur, the mighty ruler from whom all Mughals and the Mughal emperor were descended. Scientists have been able to prove that it was made in India, but we don't know the name of the artist who created it. Today, the cup is in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England, having been acquired by a Colonel Charles Seton Guthrie after the Indian Rebellion of 1857. It's only a humble drinking vessel in some respects, but it's a very beautiful one. A Mughal emperor can have been expected to drink his wine out of anything else. The Ardabil carpet isn't one carpet, it's two. When most people use the term, though, they're referring to a very large Persian carpet that can now be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England, the same place you'll find the wine cup of Shah Jahan. There's some controversy about the larger carpet, though, as it was reconstructed in the 19th century, and it appears that sections of the smaller carpet were used to help reconstruct the large one. At its current shape and size, the carpet is 34 feet long and 17 feet wide. What's left of the smaller one is currently in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in the United States of America. The style of both carpets is typical of the Tabriz design with medallions at their center and ornate designs surrounding the central medallions. It's designed to reflect the appearance of Persian gardens, which are considered symbols of paradise by Muslims. Helpfully, there's a cartouche on the largest of the carpets, which dates it to 1539. That's the earliest verifiable date on any Persian carpet. Since we're perusing the contents of the Victoria and Albert Museum, Let's talk about Henry VIII's writing desk. The Tudor monarch is one of England's most notorious, known around the world for marrying six times and having two of his wives beheaded. Perhaps those orders were written at this desk, which was made in 1525. It was made by the king's royal workshop and is covered with ornamental motifs associated with the Tudors. Oddly for the England of the time, not all of the religious symbols on its surface are Christian. There are also depictions of Venus and Mars, both of which are based on woodcuts made by German artist Hans Bruckmeier. The coat of arms of Catherine of Aragon also appears on the desk. She was Henry's first wife, but the presence of her coat of arms doesn't necessarily mean that the desk was no longer used after the marriage ended. Henry may have divorced her, but he didn't have her executed and remained fond of her even after the marriage ended. In fact, Someone was still using the desk as recently as the 18th century, which is when its loop handles and ball feet were added. 
there are two names for our next artifact. It's known as the Codex Tonindai, but it's also known as the Codex Zuchnutal. This incredibly well-preserved, accordion-folded codex is a pre-Columbian collection of mixtech pictography. There are only 16 surviving Mexican manuscripts that can be verified as entirely pre-Columbian, and this is one of the most important ones. The Codex Zuch Natal name comes from the American archaeologist Zelia Natal, who published the Codex in 1902, and Baroness Zuch, who sponsored her work. Experts say that the Codex was made during the 14th century. It contains 47 pieces of animal skin folded together like a screen, covered in vivid paintings. Those paintings contain our only record of the lives and achievements of several leaders of Oaxaca, a mixtec city-state. During the 11th and 12th centuries, the achievements of Lord Eight Deer Jaguar Claw are especially venerated, indicating that he was the city-state's greatest ruler. We're fortunate that the Codex survived the brutality of the Spanish invasion, after which it found its way to the Monastery of San Marco in Florence before eventually ending up in the British Museum. Here's a relic of another culture that existed in Central America before the arrival of Christopher Columbus and the Spanish. It's the Taino Ritual Seat. Made from wood and gold, the seat takes the form of a human being on all fours. Unusually for a wooden artifact, experts aren't sure when the artifact was made. All they can say is that it happened somewhere between the beginning of the 13th century and the end of the 15th. The Taino ritual seat was found in a cave close to the city of Santo Domingo, which is in the Dominican Republic, but it might have been moved there for safekeeping. The wood that it's made from is actually from Jamaica. The correct name for a carved seat like this is a duho, and duhos can be found in the homes of Taino chiefs throughout the Caribbean. The Taino people were among the first that Columbus met in the Americas, by which time their civilization had existed for 7,000 years. According to records from the time, Taino chiefs sat in the chairs and smoked hallucinogenic drugs. There are traces of cojoba seeds in a bowl attached to the chair, which seems to confirm the accuracy of the stories. The Gundestrup Cauldron is in remarkably good condition for a silver vessel that's been around for 2,200 years. It's a relic of the Roman Iron Age and is the largest known example of Iron Age silverwork ever discovered in Europe, with a diameter of 27 inches and a height of 17 inches. The cauldron was in pieces when it was discovered in a peat bog near Gundestrup, Denmark in 1891, but it has since been lovingly pieced back together. These days, you'll find it inside the National Museum of Denmark in the country's capital city of Copenhagen. The various plates that make up the artifact are decorated with repasse work, hammered from behind to push out the silver into the desired shape. Once that was done, the ancient artisan or artisans who worked on the piece added extensive gilding and even inlaid glass for the eyes of the various figures represented. The style of the Gundestrup cauldron isn't typical of the Scandinavian artistry of the era, and may instead be Thracian or Gaulish in origin. To add to the mystery, the scenes on its surface are a mixture of Near Eastern iconography and Celtic myths and legends. Beringer's lying stones are a lasting reminder that nobody's too smart to be fooled. The stones are carved into the shape of a number of mythical animals and were found by Professor Johann Bartholomeus Adam Beringer in 1725. At the time, the professor was the dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Würzburg in Germany. During the early 18th century, nobody had really nailed down the definition of what a fossil was. Beringer had heard of fossils, though, and because these pieces of stone looked like animals, he thought they were fossils. He reached that conclusion despite the fact that the Hebrew name of God was etched into the surface of some of them. Instead of being put off by that, he took it as a sign that the animals were of divine origin. He wrote a book about his stones, but soon after it was published, he found out the stones had been planted for him to find by another professor at the university, who thought Beringer was arrogant and wanted to prank him. Beringer took the hoaxer to court for sullying his name and won his case. 
but his damaged reputation never recovered. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.